we were at our alma mater uh, at, back at Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it has been over a decade since uh, we went back on campus. Not only were we students there, but I was also uh, the campus pastor or chaplain of the university. So a lot of memories go back that were wonderful, wonderful memories. Then just this morning, uh, Sarah Touche uh, uh, came up and said, I was one of your student chaplains, and immediately we recognized her name because she and her husband were some of our very first supporters in prayer and finances when we had nothing to show for having come out to the D.C. metro area, and uh, other than that we had hearts to serve. Uh, they believed in the vision. They believed in the mission. Now, here you are today. Here's the wonderful things that God is doing and trips going to Romania and all of these various things. And Sarah, I thank you for your obedience and your faithfulness to believe you wouldn't be here in this way were it not for people like this who have supported our church. Let's show our love to Sarah and wait an extension to her husband. But going back to ORU, uh, it was fascinating. About six or seven new buildings on campus. That wasn't the case for decades. We'd just be in the same old buildings. Uh, and some of those needed to be imploded. I'll just be honest about it. And, uh, and then to see now these beautiful state-of-the-art buildings that are there. Dr. Billy Wilson has done an outstanding job as president of the university. And uh, if you know of Hobby Lobby, if you ever think of going to Hobby Lobby or you don't know where to go to get for something that Hobby Lobby has, I would encourage you to go to Hobby Lobby and Mardell's. I don't know if they have Mardell's out here. I know they have Hobby Lobby. And the reason why is those who created Hobby Lobby uh, are believers and they believe in God, and they are, uh, they always say the billionaire came in and bailed out the university. Um, well, do you know that they give 50% of what comes into the work of the, of the gospel? 50%. That's amazing. That's inspiring. And uh, they've given over $300 million to Oral Roberts University since we were there, and you can tell. Some people say it's more towards $500 million. But it's amazing to see the buildings. Got to go back into a chapel service. That's what I used to uh, serve as leader of the uh, chapel services. Well, it was on steroids. I mean, the students were so electric, so on fire for God that without even knowing anybody's watching them, there they were worshiping God with all their hearts. And when the speaker was speaking, they were like this. Now, I want you to learn from... Amen, brother. So, but really amazing. Gentis and Franklin spoke. We had uh, Daryl Strawberry, one of the big, biggest hitters of all time on baseball in our, in our meetings. All those things were neat. But it's the students that really grabbed my heart. Because when I was a student, I remember being in chapel services that so stirred my heart that all I wanted to do was get out behind the chapel, fall on my knees and say, God, I love you and I honor you and I want to serve you. Please use me. Please use me. And those are the things that I remember as I walk those grounds. I remember a, a former chaplain. I was the chaplain of the university or campus pastor. There's been, I think, four in the history of the university. I was the fourth. I broke the mold. Uh, they haven't had one since. But Bob Stamps was the second Chaplain, his wife used to be the personal assistant to Corey Ten Boom. We used to hear these wonderful stories, and uh, you know of uh, those days. But Bob Stamp said to me, "Bill, the day will come where you'll come back to this campus, and nobody knows you. You'll walk the campus; people won't even, you know, know know that one there was a day when you were the chaplain here, and where where you were the one leading the services and these things." But he said, "The rest of your life, for those." who knew you as their campus pastor, they will always see you as pastor. They will always want you to be proud of the things they're doing in life. And they will always want you to be there for prayer if they're going through something difficult. And I found that to be true. And it's happened all of these years. Then there was another special part to the trip. And I say this because Pastor Jeff was up here and ministering last Sunday. And it's so good to know when when we're gone, we have somebody like Pastor Jeff or Pastor Julie, you know, uh, ones on the team uh, who will step up and, and cover the pulpit so that we can be away for some of these things. But I got to go see my brother. Now, just these are introductory comments. So I'll jump into the message here. But some of you will remember that 
we were in a prayer meeting before the prayer meeting. In other words, right through these doors, we were praying for the service that was about to happen in the evening right here. Uh, then the big service would be in this, in this room. And I got a, a message from Aubrey, our oldest daughter, and it was, Dad, uh, re uh, reach out to me. Um, I'm trying to get a hold of you. And I thought, well, I'll get a hold of her after I'm done with that pre-prayer service. And then, boom, second daughter, Dad, get a hold of me right away. And I thought, okay, it's an emergency. Something's happening. They're away at Liberty uh, University, and so something's going on. So I got in touch with Aubrey, and she said, Dad, get a hold of your niece. She's with your brother right now. Uncle Todd may have had a stroke. So I put the prayer meeting in capable hands and just stayed backstage as I'm trying to get a hold of people. Got a hold of my niece. She said, yes, uh, uncle, or, or my dad's right here. Um, we do think he had a stroke. Um, he will not go to the hospital. Now, there's something stubborn in, in us. You know, we think if we could sleep a little bit, everything will be okay, you know. I, I mean, my family's tried to get me to go to the hospital now and then, and they have to pretty much just push me out the door and tell me if I don't go, I, I lose dessert or something, something. <laughs> but so my wife, Lisa, she, she knows Tess. And she said, okay, Michelle, have your dad stick his tongue straight out, then have him, you know, do, smile, see if there's any drooping in that, then have him lift his arms. She knew these tests I didn't know. And then I, I talked with her privately where my brother wasn't listening, said, how did it go? And uh, she said, when he tried to stick, stick his tongue out straight, it went to the side. It never went straight. He's in, the, he's in the restroom now. I'm thinking he went to the restroom because he then knew something was wrong and he's looking in the mirror and doesn't want to concern his daughter. So I said, Michelle, get all of his stuff packed. I'm going to do my best to tell my brother to go to the emergency room. I know I'm thousands of miles away. He may not listen to me. I'm the younger brother. He doesn't like the hospital. He thinks that's where you go to get sick. Um, but I'll do my best. So, so he comes back out of the restroom and I... I she put him on, and I said, Todd, Michelle, I've asked her to pack all your things. I am sending you to the emergency room. Do you understand? I was trying to be as forceful as I could. And he said, yes. So he must have seen some things when he went in the restroom there. And then he went to the hospital, and Lisa said, when you talk with your brother, Bill, just be aware to say the things that you would need to say if you need to. In other words, this might be your last call with him. He had had two strokes. And so I talked to my brother. Well, it'd be alarming for me to say, hey, Todd, I love you so much. We as brothers just, you know, wouldn't necessarily say it that way. And it'd scare the living daylights out of him if all of a sudden I'm professing so much love as he's at the hospital. But I did my best, of course, to love on him. And then that was the last fluid conversation I've had with my brother. He lost his voice. Uh, he, he can't write with his right hand. There's a lot to the story. So we went to Oklahoma City to see Todd. Now he can put about five words together. It's labored, but he can put them together. We can communicate. He can uh, type with his left hand, you know, a text. He has a better memory than I do. And it was beautiful to be able to see him. And I said, Todd, what do you look forward to? And I know he looks forward to. He's having two grandchildren before the end of the year. I know he already mentioned that to us. That'll be seven for him. I've got one. Let's get cracking, daughters. Okay. But anyway. <laughs> but... All that to say, we were able to take him out, get him an early Christmas gift uh, of a TV at Best Buy. So if you're my friend on Facebook, you'll be able to see my brother there beside of the TV. He's been saving his money for over a year to be able to get something. We just thought, well, let's just go get it for him. And uh, so he now has a 75-inch, because you know you need, you need something like that in a small apartment, but it's a... <laughs> It was such a blessing to be able to be with Todd uh, again. He's the only one that shares my memories from childhood uh, that's still living. And so just amazing, amazing trip. And I thank you guys for being a part of just being, you know, um, 
patient with us maybe to take a trip, but it was wonderful in every way. I could go on and on. Okay, today, throw yourself into the work. That's the title of my message, and I want to defy this idea that's out there that is towards the thinking of, I'll get around to it someday. I'll get to it just when I'm ready, when it's more convenient, when it seems like it's the thing to do, maybe when I have more money, when I have more people that I know that are the right people, when I get around to it. I remember when I was uh, just a young guy, I didn't even have my driver's license yet, and uh, Dr. Robert Schuler at the Garden Grove Community Church that ended up being the Crystal Cathedral in Southern California, uh, where we were attending at the time, uh, he said, hey, there are positions that you can be a part of what's happening in the ministry outreach of this church, and God can use you, and you can see the postings in the lobby. Well, I went back to the lobby, and I saw one that I just felt like I focused in on, and, and, uh, and it would tell the person you're to connect with, give their phone number, but it, all the titles there were so amazing. And this one was the director of all traffic cones and stanchions. And, play, you know, and, the, and then the job description was that you were to be there on Saturday night and put out all the stanchions, all the traffic cones. Well, these traffic cones were rubber, big orange things that were about this tall. So it was a big deal to be carrying those out. And it didn't matter what the weather was like. They all needed to be up and ready on Sunday morning. Like I say, I didn't have a license yet to drive. So my mom was kind enough to uh, allow me to be able to fulfill my role by being the director of the cones and put them out all across the campus. And I was so proud of seeing them on Sunday morning and seeing the people guided just the right direction by what I did and the bulletins that were placed out. And I used to, on Saturday nights, go up in the pulpit where Dr. Schuler would preach and I would pretend that I was the preacher and I would be up there until somebody sees me and then I just go down, you know. But those were days of being stirred to believe that God could use me. I know God can use you. I know that God has a calling on each and every life and that as we fulfill that and we step out, God uses us greatly. There's a football analogy that I could use of 11 uh, you know, people that grab a hold of that ball and their whole purpose is to advance that ball and to have that ball in their possession and to get a touchdown. You have thousands of people in the stands, maybe millions watching by television, but it's really just 11 people who do all the work down there and hold the ball. And that's an analogy for the church. I don't believe that it should just be the few. I believe as we all put forth what God is doing, and we do our part here and there, whether small or great, it's all great in God's eyes. Can I hear an amen to that? Jesus put it this way. He said, the, har the, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. And Henry Thoreau said this statement. He said, be not merely good, be good for something. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That word workmanship actually in the Greek is the word poema, from which we get the word poem. So you are God's poem. He's writing a story in your life, and it is as beautiful as poetry. Workmanship, that word there, is actually a work of art, is what is being stated. God's writing the advancement of the kingdom, of his kingdom through you. You're doing it right where you live. Some of you, I know, are taking care of children. You may be taking care of a family member. There may be things that you're doing that you feel Nobody really sees you in what you do. Oh, I'm telling you, God is watching, and God will bless. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, who do his will, who will be his poems. It is in your DNA to serve the kingdom of God. When we get to heaven, if we've come by way of the cross and what Jesus did in dying for our sins and rising from the dead, if we will come the only way that you can come, through the cross, then we will know what it is to be together in heaven. That's the confirmed way we read about in the scriptures. The only confirmed way, the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
And we're all on a journey. We're all trying to find the truth. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Luke 16, 10, the Bible says, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And that's a great statement there. It ought to be a revelation. We ought to put it on a pillow. We ought to put it on a wall. Because it'll be a reminder then of what is the truth of God. Whoever can be trusted in very little. I'm telling you, I've known some people who have done great things in life. But if I can get them to tell their story, I'll find obedience somewhere. When nobody was watching and nobody knew. But God was watching. His eyes go to and fro throughout the whole earth to find the ones whose hearts are toward him, the Bible tells us. So before Jesus was crucified and before he rose from the dead, before he ascended uh, to heaven, he met with his disciples. And these are the very ones that he will trust with the early church. There's something about a launch. There's something about the early days. And I can say this with having lived it out in my life. And Lisa knows she's lived it out in her life. It's very personal to us that there is something about the early days. Don't let anybody talk you out of what God is stirring your heart to do. Because there will be those who will, even with good intention, with the best of uh, meaning thoughts, they'll say, oh, by the way, like they said to us when we first came to the, to the D.C. metro area, oh, so-and-so is doing what you're talking about, the vision that you have, and so-and-so is doing and they meant it to encourage us. And it was encouraging in one way, but then in another way we were thinking, well, if so-and-so is doing it and so-and-so is doing it, why don't we just go back to Tulsa? <laughs> but the reality is the ministry that God has through you is extremely unique. There will be people that only you can touch and impact in the way that you can. He said, no, no, no. Hey, that's for the ones that have a reverend before. That's for the ones in full-time ministry. That's for the ones that are well-known. And, and, and used to it in a specific unique calling. There are unique callings. Certainly the Bible talks about unique gifts and callings. But I think of it in regard to when the kids were small. And if I had to get into, we had a minivan at the time. It was great. I mean, you just, you just start the process of opening that door and it opens itself. I know you guys are young and the technology has gone way past that. But that was a big deal. You don't even have to pull on that thing. It just does it by itself. And, you know, if we dropped something and I'm on the, in the driver's seat and Lisa's in the passenger seat and all of a sudden I drop something down in between, you know what I'm talking about? That tight space that you cannot get your hand through and you just mention it to one of the kids. It's like, oh, I got that, Dad. They can reach right through in a place I could never reach through to to get that. No one is too small or has been through something that God would say, oh, no, I won't use you now. Instead, as we submit ourselves to him and say, God, please use me, he'll do that very thing. And again, what a beautiful thing to be used by Almighty God. I'm still blown away that we can be used by God. But in those launch times, don't let the enemy talk you out of the things that may not have been manifest yet before your eyes, but God is all over it. That's the way it starts. Jesus, we see before he was crucified and risen again and ascended, he gets together with this tight team of individuals. It's a small group. And he wraps himself in a towel. And he washes his disciples' feet. And I just can't, it's staggering to think of that almighty God would bow before mere men. But he's doing it as the very last object lesson before he goes to the cross. Now, think of all the things that he could have modeled before, you know, his, his uh, disciples, before that group of, of men that he had chosen to launch the early church. He could have given a lesson that had to do with the favor of God and the reward system. It'd be beautiful. We'd all want to hear about it. We'd all take notes. It's not what he does. He wraps himself with a towel. He bows down, picks up dirty feet, and he begins to clean the feet of his disciples. Of all lessons, he taught how to humbly serve. 
In Luke 22, 27, in the second part of that verse, Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. Wow. A servant is one who unselfishly gives of themselves in any situation in order to meet the needs of others to the glory of God. And I can tell you that one of the most accurate indicators of your maturity in God is whether you serve and you serve the kingdom of God. Colossians 3, 23 through 24, whatever you do, work at it with what? All your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will, be, you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Christ that you are serving. In Genesis 15, 2, but Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? Now, immediately when I hear that, I'm thinking he's opening his heart. He's getting vulnerable. He's telling things he just wouldn't tell everybody. He's telling the places where there's a hole in his heart. He's speaking of things that people don't speak much of. And he's saying it to the very one who can help him. And since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And it's here that we are introduced to the steward of Abraham. A steward is one who practices practical obedience in the administration of everything under God's control, all entrusted to them. So Eleazar is responsible over all of Abraham's flocks, over all of his herds, over all of his finances. His job is to make certain that Abraham's household and business are run smoothly and successfully. His primary goal is promoting the interests of Abraham. Let's look in Genesis. Here's in the Old Testament. We'll go back to the book of, of beginnings. And the Bible says, I don't know why I took all the tags out of my Bible after first service. I was used to the days where we had one service, I guess. And what a beautiful thing to have two services and to have you coming. And if you're brand new today, you're so welcome. Listen, Genesis in the 24th chapter, starting with the 34th verse. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly, and he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. Now, Eleazar is so dependable, so excellent at what he does, that he's given a very important task, perhaps the most important task that could be thought of, at least in that season of Abraham's life. He was sent hundreds of miles away to find a wife for his son, Isaac one that would be suitable. And he was successful. He found one that is a woman of God, was a woman of God named Rebecca. And there are many things that we ourselves, as we bring it right to our own doorstep, should steward with excellence. Now, so what are some of those things? And these are biblical. This is from the scriptures. This is not just my thoughts. We are to steward with excellence the earth's resources. Maybe we don't think about that, but we should steward the earth's resources with excellence. Our personal possessions, we should steward with excellence. Our bodies, our health. What does the Bible say, say about our bodies? That we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Influence, we are to steward that well. We're not just to simply know we have it, or use it for our own personal things in regard to our career, there is an element to our influence that is all about the kingdom of God. I'm so thankful for the ones who have invited people to come to Capital Life. I'm so thankful that you have taken that step because many of you came through an invitation of one of your friends that was here. Others of you I know in this high-tech day and age, internet. There are many things we should steward, again, with excellence. Now, Ephesians 4.1, Paul the Apostle, who wrote some one-third of the New Testament, this powerful man of God, he said, I urge you, that's, that's powerful language there, I urge you 
to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Every one of you has a calling. I don't want to get to the end of my life and say, you know what, I figured it out in the last year. Why not step into the calling of God by pursuing his heart till he confirms how he has called us and the things that we can be effective in and all the things that we're to steward well. Colossians 4.17, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. So that tells me that there are those who don't take heed and who do not fulfill the calling of the Lord. That's not you. Your calling is something that's attached to your pursuance of God. And I can tell by the fact that you are here today or watching online, I can tell there's something inside of you that really wants to honor God and please him. Nothing's too small. The challenge is to be intentional in three things. Number one, your gifts. Every believer has, God, has God-given gifts and talents and skill sets. I've always been amazed as we came to the D.C. metro area, just what unique skill sets were here in this area. It's not that Tulsa, Oklahoma didn't have that, but they didn't. And so here we are with these unique skill sets. I remember the days before COVID when we would have people come up to get the communion, to receive communion. And we would give the elements and they'd, I'd reach out sometimes to place my hand on a shoulder just of praying blessing on somebody. And then they'd reach out to place their hand on my shoulder. And that's when I would see what I saw, a gun right underneath the coat. And I'm thinking, take as much of the elements as you want, just go... <laughs> We have some unique things that people do out here. I knew there were snipers. I didn't know there were counter snipers. I started learning a lot of things in being in this area. And then you ask people what they do, and you'll hear some of the things, and you'll be blown away and amazed. And then you'll ask about 50% of the people what they do out here, and they're all accountants. <laughs> they aren't really. But that's what they think they can fool their pastor into believing. I know better. <laughs> You come back with a tan after three months we haven't seen you, we know. <laughs> You're doing more than the accounting work. So we are to invest these things into the kingdom of God, our gifts, our skills, our talent sets. Galatians 6.10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Now, could have just stopped right there because that would have been a powerful statement but it goes on, especially, now that word is a unique, it's almost like a comma that's a pause in the sentence and sends you in another direction. That when you think you know what the person's saying, there's that little pause comma moment where they just send you in another direction as well. So they're saying this, but they're also saying this. There's an especially, and what is that in regard to? To those who belong to the kingdom of God. That's why, you know, we certainly do outreach and we do all these things that are beyond this community and we do it as a community and it's, ex it's, it's extremely important because that, that's somebody learning that God loves them. That's somebody learning that somebody will know their name. We have vulnerable people when we go into McPherson Square and we minister to the physical needs of people and clothing and and, and a number of things that we give out and food and other things. And McDonald's, we've mentioned that, has partnered with us. And it's, it's a wonderful moment to, to do all that. But you can't help but wonder how many of those who have lined up in this long line, how many of them have family members that even know where they are? If that's on God's heart, that ought to be on our heart. And yet... There's an especially that is for believers and for the people that are part of the family of God. And this is where we want to be there for one another. We shouldn't have anybody go through loss and hard times without somebody being there for them. You may say, well, I don't know all the details, and so I'll just keep my distance. We need to show the love of God even without knowing all the details even without knowing everything, because God's love doesn't stop even when somebody messes up. And then there are things that aren't about messing up, but it's brokenness. And I can tell you that when my mom went to be with the Lord when I was 26 years of age, and she now represent, then represented all 
mom and dad and the whole root system. And people were kind and gave me cards and they told me they were praying for me. And after about a week and a half to two weeks, they all moved on. I hadn't. We as the church need to be there for one another and strengthen one another, especially to those who belong in the kingdom of God. We'll get to know each other's stories. We'll be in positions to be able to bring a meal. We'll be in positions to be able to celebrate you when you thought you achieved something and nobody really is around to celebrate. We'll be there with you. Proverbs 18, 16, the second part of that verse, a gift opens the way. And I could go on and on about that. Second, your time. This might be one of the most valuable things of all. It's almost like we have a, a pie. And if I give a slice of the pie over to this, I don't, I don't have a full pie anymore to be able to do this and this and this. Well, just drop the pie and do what the Lord is nudging you to do because God has moments where he'll give you an exponential blessing to where what you're doing in the other parts of the pie will go way beyond in the time that you thought you needed to do it. You'll be able to do it quicker. You'll be able to have greater effect. When God nudges your heart, always say yes. It could be an altar time. It could be going to a colleague. It could be a phone call to somebody that you haven't talked to in a long time. And if you are the one, and let me speak to you as to who you are. I believe you are the one who will make the phone call and bring the healing that needs to come. Um, I don't know, Mark. I think of being with you in your office. And uh, Mark's here. I don't normally point people out because I know that's, uh, nobody wants that. <laughs> but here it is anyway. United States senator. And as he's serving, he doesn't ever ask me to leave the room. Doesn't matter what phone call he's on or what meetings he's in, he's the same person. So he's talking with people from back in Arkansas. And I thought, he's a pastor. He got a pastor's heart. I mean, he's talking with people in hospital rooms, he's talking with people who have gone through something and what it means to get that phone call of encouragement. I'm praying for you, I'm thinking about you. It matters. It matters. And it can be done in, in all different ways. Now, we have ways here that you can serve the church. But we should be walking servants wherever we go, always aware of others. I still think of that story of, of William Booth who started the Salvation Army. And, uh, and somebody asked him, you know, uh, sent the message with the question, what is the reason for your success? What's the formula? What's the secret? He sent back one word by telegram to the person, others. And there it is. God wants us to be aware of others, concerned about others. We're all given 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. I challenge you not to spend your time, but rather to invest your time in the kingdom of God. Now, let's go to the next thing, which is number three, your resources. Uh, in October, we do, we're going to do what is called the Rooted Campaign. And we did this a year ago, where in the month of October, we're thinking of just advancing everything that the church is doing. And there's so many things. But also, in blessing what we need to have things done with this building, to be able to have a headquarters of hope. And so, we'll be talking about that more in the next uh, couple of weeks. But there is a miracle that is happening, and I'm not going to share it today, but either next Sunday or the Sunday after, God is really blessing us, and, and uh, I'm going to tell you about that, blessing us as a church. Uh, we're not going anywhere, but it blessing us as a church, so we'll talk about that. Let's go to Malachi. Nobody ever goes to Malachi anymore, and I, I um, again, I pulled all my notes, but here we go. Ready? Malachi. We're in what is the third chapter and starting here in the eighth verse. Strong words, but it gets across a concept here that we need to hear. Uh, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, 
and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not room, uh, be, uh, there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a de delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. All that you and I have is on loan. The more we go through life, the more we're, we're, we're in a place of realizing it. We won't hold on to what we have. We just won't. And if we can place what we have, whether it be our skill sets and our talents and our abilities, again, in this area, so many amazing things that can be done to touch the church, not just our career over here, but be holistic in it and bless what God's doing. And not only that, our time, and, but not only that, our resources, and be good stewards in all of these ways. And God, being a rewarder, sees it. And in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, in the six through eight uh, verses, and we may just put it up on the screen here, and... Um, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. It's not a Hallmark card. It's the truth of God. And when I've seen people do it, and when we in our own lives have done this and lived this out, we see the blessings of God just come in that we don't even expect. They just come with a phone call, and we're like, wow, look at God. I used to have a staff member back at ORU. Look at God. Every time you say something good, look at God, look at God. It's like, stop saying that. I get what you mean. But anyway, <laughs> look at God. No matter how small, serve. And when opportunities are given, jump in. And if we all do it, easy task. But so much that is accomplished. In 1984, there was a movie that was uh, exciting to me that came out. I know some of you may not have been around at that time, but... It's called Karate Kid. I think I liked it because, you know, the kid didn't look like he ever lifted weights in his life, and he was still taking out the enemy, you know, the opponent. Ralph Macchio played the role of Daniel's son, and, uh, and we see that he was confronted as a new kid on the block by bullies. The custodian was Mr. Miyagi, played by Pat Morita, a Japanese man, takes interest in this boy named uh, Daniel, calls him Danielson, and uh, says he will teach him karate. And when Daniel shows up, Mr. Miyagi does not give him karate lessons, as he expected. Instead, he gives him what seems like meaningless tasks. And he's feeling as if uh, he's being treated like a slave. He doesn't care for it. So he confronts Mr. Miyagi, and he learns that he is learning powerful lesson, and that is muscle memory that will aid him in defensive moves in karate. Stewarding our gifts, our time, our money builds us up to a place where there's breadth to our usefulness, where there's depth to things that are eternal and the touching of others' lives where there's influence, not only for what we do in life as a career, but influence for the kingdom of God that then is all over our career. Each of you has something unique to give, and an availability is what is most important. We've got people taking care of the next generation right now. It matters to us, doesn't it? Those of us that are parents that are able to be seated here and receive the word of God, to know that there are people that are very capable and have said yes to, and responded to being used. Uh, we've got people that are making sure that my uh, voice is heard right now, so do you, you don't have to yell, what? Uh, and we thank you. We thank the team in the back. Let's show them our love and appreciation. <laughs> Ones that have greeted you well today and made sure that you had hospitality, you may be drinking the very coffee that they gave you. God's doing something here. He's on the move. There are moments where the grace of God is nigh. In other words, very, very near. I kind of think of that story of 
when the angels troubled the water. If you got in quick, you got the healing. First one in would be assured of healing, but then people people wouldn't be able to get in. I wasn't touched. God, don't you know my name? Listen. God is here for each and every one of you in such a special and unique way. And the grace of God is here and the power of the Holy Spirit. He is our divine paraclete, the one called alongside to help. The staff alone cannot do all that needs to be done for the, all the things that are done to touch lives through this ministry, through this church. Far exceeds what the staff alone can do. That's why it's so powerful to have people like the Romania team say yes like those who are taking care of us today say yes. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, second part of that verse in the Message Bible says, throw yourselves into the work. Here's the title of my message today. To the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. Before Pastor Jeff comes up in just a second, there's a poem that I love. It's not even a poem. It was really just out of one of his sermons. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and I've always loved the way he said it. I have gone back to this over and over again. Listen to these words that he gave in one of his messages. If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted, like Beethoven composed music, like Shakespeare wrote poetry, he should street, uh, sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. God is watching even when others are not. And I believe he's watching your faithfulness. I know he blesses obedience. And I can't say enough about this church and who you are. God, if anybody here doesn't know you, I ask God that even as they place their hand on their heart, they'll be saying, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me and that he rose from the dead and I receive that today. I don't want to have a question mark over where I stand with you, God. Just put your hand on your heart if that's you. Some of you are saying, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I hear about the Holy Spirit. I want to have that tangible presence of God on me. I want to see the things that the heroes of the faith see, have seen. And I want to be a part of this movement. Just put your hand on your heart. That's you. And God, fill people to every fiber of their being. And God, we thank you that those who have said yes to you can now know that they're a child of yours. It'll change everything. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name.